Written in Bone, Chapter 8, Expect the Unexpected. In 1659, eight years before the priests of St. Mary's City built the brick chapel under which the lead coffin people were eventually buried, Maryland's colonial government granted a parcel of land to an Englishman named Thomas Taylor. Described in the historical record as a gentleman, Taylor established a tobacco plantation on the site, which is located north of St. Mary City, across the Chesapeake Bay. Although little is known of him, historians do know that over the next hundred years, the land was farmed by subsequent owners who grew tobacco, corn, and apples. Later, during the 1900s, the property was given the name Harley by the people who lived there. In 2004, Maryland archaeologist Darren Lowry was trekking across the ridge of a low hill near a tidal creek on the Harley property. His eyes were caught by something peculiar, a number of large cobblestones placed about the hill's ridge. From its studies of the geology of the area, Lowry knew that the hill had been formed thousands of years earlier, when winds had swept very fine silt and sand, mounding it into a knoll about 15 feet high. While the wind had been strong enough to carry fine sand, it certainly couldn't have carried the cobbles that Lowry had seen. Each one looked as if it weighed a couple of pounds, but Lowry was sure he'd seen similarly arranged cobbles somewhere else. Let's go back to this page here and look at our image. So look at the caption. Cobblestones caught the eye of Deer and Lowry at what came to be known as Harley Knoll. They told him the site might have been a cemetery, and archaeologists used ribbons to label the stones. So here, here we are out in the woods. You can see the ribbons that the archaeologist used. Here's another picture. Harley Knoll, located across the Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay and north of St. Mary's City, looked like anything but a burial place. It was overgrown with trees and grasses and surrounded by a small creek. So you can see this creek right here is running through, and the archaeological team is up on the hill examining the cobblestones. Finally, he remembered. The cobbles he'd seen had been in a colonial cemetery. They'd been used as grave markers. But the knoll wasn't near a church or any sort of building at all. It was out in the country, surrounded by trees, grasses, and the meandering tidal creek. Could this little knoll be a graveyard? Doug Owsley and his team of archaeologists, along with a group of Maryland students and teachers, whom he'd spe specially trained for the task, were called in to investigate. For archaeological purposes, the site was given the name Harley Knoll. Given that the historical records showed the land had been granted to a colonist during the 17th century, Owsley hoped to locate graves belonging to people who had lived during that period. Still, since very little was known about the Harley Knoll area, he alerted his team to be on the lookout for the unexpected. As archaeologist Dana Coleman recalled, Owsley advised us that surprises were a possibility. First, the site was gridded and mapped, said the archaeologist Lori Burgess. Then, ground-penetrating radar was used to identify potential burials. The GPR revealed that the knoll contained 35 underground features, spaced at regular intervals from one another, many of which were the right size for graves. Some of the underground features were located close to the cobbles that Darren Lowry had observed. Since GPR can't create an identifiable image of a buried object, the team couldn't conclusively declare that the features were graves. Still, the GPR evidence pointed strongly in that direction. So here we have um, William Hanna on the right and John Emley on the left. They're dragging the ground penetrating radar. This is the GPR. You can see it between them. Uh, this the antenna across the Harley Knoll and this the echoes from the radar indicate where buried objects such as coffins might lie. The first discoveries. The land over, landowner gave the team permission to excavate 12 of the suspected features. Each feature was assigned to an archaeologist who directed the excavation and a work crew. The dirt removed from the potential grave shafts was sifted through mesh screens to catch any artifacts that it might contain. Digging in the fine sand was easy, but maintaining the high standards of precision that characterized the work of Owsley and his team was not. At archaeological sites with soil that's loamy or contains clay, it's easy to have straight, clean sidewalls, the sides of an excavated shaft, explained Burgess. The sandy deposits at Harley Knoll made straight sidewalls impossible to maintain. The soil had a texture that was like fine sugar. So you'll remember that when they are um, working with the grave shafts, they want the solid wall surrounding whatever is buried inside of it. 
but with, because the sand is so fine, the, the wall tends to, to cave in. It's not a solid wall anymore when they start digging. As the crew excavated, it became clear the soil had not lain undisturbed for several hundred years. It was crisscrossed with stains left by twisting tree roots that had grown down into the soil and then died and decomposed. Other stains showed that animals had disturbed the soil by digging burrows. Soon, several of the crews began to uncover fragile pieces of wood. The shape of the pieces, the soil stain patterns around them, and the presence of rust-colored nails told the team they had found the remains of coffins. The Harley Knoll site was indeed a cemetery. Because wood decomposes fairly quickly in the Chesapeake area, it's rare to find wooden remains of colonial coffins. The Knoll's fine sandy soil was the key to the preservation in this case. Water drains through sand quickly, so the coffins buried on the knoll hadn't rested in moist soil for long periods of time. Let's look at this. We have work crews remove dirt above and sifted the soil below of 12 different spots on the Harley Knoll. So you can see in the top picture that they are digging and then below, this is the mesh that they use to sift through the sand, it catches the artifacts. So what they were just saying in these couple of paragraphs is this sand, because it drains water very quickly, the, um, the coffins don't have time to sit in the water, which means they don't decay or deteriorate as quickly as maybe um, coffins buried in clay soil. The elated team members bagged samples of the wood for laboratory analysis and placed brightly colored markers in the exact spots and positions of the nails to record their locations. The markers were photographed in situ to create a permanent record so the archaeologists would know how the separate parts of each coffin, the sides, the headboard, the footboard, and the lid, had been nailed together. As excavations proceeded, archaeologist Dell Brown encountered a strange situation at a grave designated as Harley Knoll Burial 9, HK9. Carrie Bruelheide had begun working at the head of the grave and Brown at the foot. They were soon confronted with a puzzle. The coffin wood Brown was exposing near the foot lay at a strange angle in relation to the long piece of wood Bruelheide was uncovering at the other end. The pieces should have been parallel, facing the same direction. Instead, one piece was turned. The archaeologists knew that colonial coffins were not constructed in this pattern. What could the explanation be? So here we have Carrie Bruelheide, here she is at the top, and Dale Brown below working on Burial 9. And here we have an exposed bone that belongs to HK9. You can see the legs here. Before the team could solve the mystery, Brown encountered a second oddity. As he brushed soil from the remnants of the coffin lid, he found an oyster shell in an area that would have been the top of the coffin, right in the center. It turned out to be the only shell found at Harley Knoll that was associated with a grave. Had it fallen atop the coffin naturally as the grave shaft was filled in? Or had a relative or a friend placed it there to honor the deceased person's memory? We may never know the answer. Brulheide did, however, find the answer to the first puzzle. The wood she had uncovered lay at a strange angle to Brown's wood because it belonged to another coffin, a very small one. The shaft held not one coffin, but two. Bruelheide excavated the small coffin and immediately identified the bones inside as those of a human infant. The remains, labeled as HK9A, were photographed and removed for further study in the laboratory. So here we have the shell that was placed in the center on top of the lid. And let's see, here is Bruelheide. She's brushing soil from the skull of the infant. You can see the top exposed portion of the infant's skull, HK9A. And then here, soon the team was able to be, view the baby's entire skeleton. So you can see ribs right here, the pelvis, and the legs. HK9 was missing the skull, but the rest of the bones were in good shape. They helped the researchers identify him as a man who died around age 60 in the early 1700s. Without the skull, though, they couldn't tell what his ancestry was. So here we have HK9. Remember, the infant up here is HK9A, but the adult, the male, 
in his 60s is HK9. They don't have the skull, so they can't use it for analysis to see um, if he came from Europe, Africa, or if he was Native American. The Headless Man. Meanwhile, Brown continued to excavate HK9, the other coffin in the grave shaft. The remains had been placed inside with care. The skeleton's legs and feet were straight, the arms lay alongside the body, and the hands had been positioned across the pelvis. Imagine then how startled Brown was when he cleared away the soil at the head end of the coffin, where he expected to find the skull. Instead, he found a third puzzle. The skull was missing. Where could it be? Had this individual been beheaded? Careful interpretation of the coffin remnants and clues from the soil solved the mystery. The infant's coffin actually lay inside part of HK9's coffin. The only way the small coffin could have ended up within the large one was if the infant had been buried at a later time, after HK9's coffin had begun to decompose. It seems likely that the people burying the baby were unaware of the location of the previous grave. By accident, the grave diggers had disturbed the head of HK9's grave and dislodged the skull. Brown and Brulehida excavated more soil from the area around the end of HK9's coffin. They found one tooth, a molar, so they knew that the skull had been there, but there was no further trace of it. The skull's whereabouts remain a mystery, so they believe that HK9, the 60-year-old gentleman, had died before the infant, and then when they were digging the infant's grave, the grave diggers didn't know HK9 was there, and so it disturbed his grave. HK9's bones, while showing evidence of age, were in fairly sturdy condition. Some of the smaller bones had been decayed somewhat, and the right clavicle had been broken into two sometime after burial. Other bones had scratch-like marks on them, etchings made by roots that grew into the coffin. The robust quality of the long bones and the pelvic bones enabled Brulhida to determine the skeleton had belonged to a man. That he was an adult was also apparent. The epiphysis of his long bones were completely fused, and the edges of some of his vertebrae had lipping, the bony spurs caused by arthritis. Together, these signs indicated the man had been about 60 years or older when he died. Hopes that the Harley Knoll burials would date to the 17th century dimmed when Brown and Brulhida found a brass button among the man's remains. They knew it was unlikely that a person in the 1600s would have been buried dressed in clothes. Furthermore, the button resembled others they had seen dated to the 1700s. More detailed study of the button would be necessary to confirm their suspicions. Written in Bone, Chapter 8, Part 2. Another Surprise. A skeleton designated as Harley Null Burial 7, or HK7, had been uncovered several feet away from HK9. The well-preserved coffin, whose narrow shape suggested that the remains placed inside had belonged to a person of slight stature, perfectly illustrated how a coffin breaks apart when it decays. As the wide flat lid decomposes, it weakens until it can no longer support the weight of the soil lying on top of it. The lid collapses inward on top of the skeleton. So here we've got our picture, HK7. This was found near HK9 and it told a different story. That's exactly what Dana Coleman found as she excavated HK7's coffin. In fact, the skull was still covered by large pieces of the lid. As eager as she was to see the skeleton that lay beneath, Coleman left the wood in place on top of the skull. She continued brushing dirt from the coffin until the entire lid was exposed. We needed to make certain that we had adequate photographs, measurements, and sketches before the coffin wood was removed, Coleman explained. Finally, Coleman removed the wood and exposed the skeleton. She expected to find the remains of a person who had come from Europe, most likely England. After all, the majority of Chesapeake colonists were English. The sight of the skull, however, immediately turned that assumption upside down. I suspected that the person was not European once I saw the face, Coleman recalled. There were features of the mid-face that were consistent with an individual of African ancestry. Owsley's examination of HK7 skull confirmed Coleman's suspicion. The angle of the front of the jaw, the rounded forehead, and the broad nasal opening were consistent with those of a person of African heritage. So here we've got our picture. The shape of the skull gave archaeologist Dana Coleman below left, so we've got Dana Coleman here, the clue that this person was of African ancestry. And here we can see that we've got 
the coffin and inside the skeleton, here's the skull and here's the vertebrae and there's the pelvis. So here's a closer picture. Um, although Coleman had, hadn't expected to find a person of African ancestry, she wasn't terribly surprised. By the late 1600s, people from Africa were working throughout the Chesapeake region. Here we can see the skull. Look at the teeth. That's much better than the teeth that we've seen in the other skeletons. Here are the ribs, the arms, the vertebrae. From African shores, Owsley and his team knew that HK7 was far from the first person of African heritage to live in the Maryland col colony. According to the historical record, that distinction belongs to Matthias de Sousa, the first known documented person of African heritage to arrive in the colony of Maryland. Although he's mentioned by name in only a few documents, historians have been able to piece together some understanding of his life and standing in the colony. Thought to be the son of an African woman and a Portuguese man, De Sousa arrived in 1634 as the indentured servant, not the slave, of Father White, a Catholic priest. De Sousa became a trader and sailor. He was very active in the St. Mary's City community and eventually served in the Legislative Assembly. As an Assembly member, he likely voted on proposed laws for the colony. This means he may have been the first person of African ancestry to vote in America. By 1650, several hundred people of African ancestry lived in the Chesapeake area. Some were indentured servants, some were slaves, and some were free people. Regardless of their social status, the new arrivals became significant members of the colonial workforce. During most of the 17th century, white servants, black servants, and black slaves worked side by side on plantations, doing similar tasks. Most shared living quarters as well. During most of this time, free black colonists had legal rights similar to those of white colonists. Court records in Virginia and Maryland prove that at least some Africans and African Americans brought grievances to the legal system and won their cases. Gradually, however, Africans and their descendants were stripped of their rights as harsh new laws concerning slavery were passed. By 1700, slavery had become firmly established in the Chesapeake area. The thousands of Africans who were forcibly brought from Africa to Maryland and Virginia colonies as slaves were regarded by law as property that could be bought and sold for life. When a female slave had a child, the child was considered a slave too. This meant that the supply of future workers increased with each birth. Increasingly, landowners found it more advantageous to own slaves rather than pay to bring servant workers from England. By the 1720s, slave labor had become the main workforce. The colonial graves that Owsley's crew excavated at Harley Knoll contained the remains of four children whose ancestry could not be definitively determined. Six adults of African ancestry, including HK7, one person of European ancestry, and one person of unknown heritage, HK9, whose ancestry remains unknown since his skull could not be examined. At this point in the investigation, no one could determine whether the colonists buried on Harley Knoll were servants, slaves, or free people. Their bones can't supply that answer. Perhaps another piece of evidence would emerge as the team continued to work. Let's look at this image in the caption. Not all the people of African ancestry living in Maryland at this time were slaves. Matthias de Sousa, for example, arrived in the colony as an indentured servant but eventually won his freedom. He was active in life around St. Mary's City and served in the legislature. His name, listed as Matt de Sousa, the third name in the left column, so here's our left, third, or the left column, here's his name right here, on this legislative document is part of the historical record. A full day's work. Meanwhile, further information gleaned from the skull, pelvic bones, and long bones and teeth gave Owsley the information he needed to conclude that HK7 was a young woman, 18 or 19 years old when she died, he estimated her height at about 5 feet. A green stain on the front of the cranium proved that her body had been shrouded. All of her teeth were in place and nicely spaced except for her wisdom teeth. They had never formed at all. Some people don't develop, don't develop wisdom teeth. Only two molars showed the first traces of developing cavities. Carrie Buohaida theorized that the condition of the young woman's teeth may have been the result of the naturally high fluoride content in the area's water supply. Fluoride slows down the rate of tooth, of tooth decay. As Owsley measured HK7 skeleton in situ, he looked for signs of what might have caused her death. 
but couldn't find anything obvious. Nor did the laboratory examination reveal any signs of an ongoing disease that had persisted long enough to affect her bones. The cause of her death remains a mystery. The laboratory examination of both HK7 and HK9 did provide evidence, however, that both individuals labored very hard for much of their lives. As the lead coffin people of St. Mary's City showed, everyone who lived in 17th and 18th century America worked, often from dawn until dusk. Heating houses, washing clothes, hunting for meat, growing crops, and even walking or boating from one place to another, all these required labor. labor. So let's get our image. The work at Harley Knoll continued. Measurements above left helped Doug Owsley determine that HK7 was a woman in her late teens and her teeth above right were in very good condition. These are beautiful teeth that, I mean, for what, 200 years post-mortem? HK9's Humeri, or upper arm bones, had enlarged areas that proved he had used his arms for tasks that demanded strong upper arm muscles. While this bone evidence didn't specifically reveal what tasks HK9 performed, the historical record and archaeological discoveries have demonstrated that colonists routinely did several kinds of work that required significant upper body and arm strength. For example, early Maryland planters didn't have plows or other large farm implements. Land had to be cleared and prepared for planting entirely by hand. To solve this problem, the colonists copied the farming methods of Native Americans. Instead of cutting down and removing all the trees, they saved labor by removing only the small trunks, leaving larger ones still standing. Even this minimal preparation required wielding an axe for hours on end. But that wasn't all. Next, Workers had to drag away the trees they'd cut and split them into clapboards and timbers to build houses and other plantation buildings. Swinging a heavy, long-handled maul, or hammer, to pound a metal wedge into a tree trunk took plenty of muscle power. But that was the only way to split a tree trunk into rails for fences and logs for firewood. Here we've got a picture. The work of slaves or servants at this time was mostly by hand. The researchers knew the bones would show exceptional muscle development if the buried people had been farm workers. The researchers compared the arm bones of HK9. The bone on the, uh, the, bone on the left is from his right arm and shows more robust development, suggesting he used his right arm more than his left. Here's his right arm, here's his left, and you can see where it is more robust in the center. The labor didn't end there either. Planting and maintaining crops took enormous effort. The historical record notes that the plantation at Harley Knoll produced tobacco, which would have required the majority of the time and energy of the planter's workforce. Maryland law also required planters to grow enough corn to feed the people who lived on their, on their land, about two acres per worker. Both crops were planted in small hills of soil, each about a foot high, which had to be hoed by hand. If moving dirt around doesn't sound that difficult, consider this. Together, the iron head and the wooden shaft of the average 17th century hilling hoe weighed about four pounds, and a single acre of tobacco contained about 2,700 hills. An acre of corn, whose plant needed more space, usually had about 1,200 hills. As the plants grew, weeds, as the plants grew, weeds grew along with them and had to be chopped away. A different type of hoe was used for this task, and it weighed even more than a hilling hoe. When the crops were ready for harvesting, they had to be not only cut down, but also bundled and carried out of the fields. So here we go. We've got a farming tool above. This was simply made the intensive labor to wield them, to cut down the trees, to split the wood into logs, to plant and weed crops, and to harvest them meant the workers' days were long and hard. Labor of this kind, repeated over a period of years, is hard on the body. As Bruel Haida had noticed during the excavation, HK9's vertebrae displayed lipping, indicating he suffered from spinal arthritis. This kind of arthritis is often related to wear and tear and is consistent with a lifetime of repetitive labor. The backbone also showed signs of a condition called diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, my goodness, or DISH. DISH is more common in men than women, and is, it usually occurs in people over 50 years old. DISH is found in people whose lives were characterized by strenuous physical activity, explained Owsley. 
Doctors are uncertain what causes it, but its effects are clear. DISH makes the tendons and ligaments along the spine harden. The bone along the sides of the vertebrae grows excessively, so much so that the vertebrae often fuse together, causing loss of mobility of the spine. The bone growth may be so severe that the bone becomes to resemble comes to resemble a partially burned candle with hardened drops of wax along its length. Nine of HK9's vertebrae were fused in this manner, in three separate separate, separate sections. Bruelheide noted that even more, th even more vertebrae had been fused, but they had broken apart some time after burial. As a person afflicted with dish, HK9 had a stiff back. At times he experienced pain, particularly in the morning before he'd had a chance to move and stretch his muscles. So here we go, a farm worker's back took continual abuse. HK9's spine here on the left showed signs of a disease called DISH, which appears mostly in older men. Several of his vertebrae slowly fused together, making it hard for him to move. You can see where they fused here in these indentations. As Bruel, Haida, and Owsley examined HK9's skeleton, other archaeologists tracked down information about the button found among the man's remains. Made of brass, the button was 0.6 inches. By comparing it with other buttons, whose manufacture dates were known, the archaeologists were able to determine that HK9's button was made between 1726 and 1776. Thus, he could, he could not have died before 1726, and most likely died sometime during this 50-year period. Because HK7 was buried near the old man, at about the same depth and aligned in the same direction, the people who dug the second grave must have known and remembered the location and alignment of the first. HK9 and HK7, therefore, died within a few years of each other. Hence, the button may shed some light on the circumstances of HK7's life. The historical record indicates that during the period in which the button had been made, the people who owned the knoll had also owned slaves. Also during that period, the majority of African and Americans in Maryland were slaves. So it seems likely, though not certain, that HK7 and the other people of African heritage buried at Harley Knoll were slaves. And if HK9 was African as well, it's equally likely that he was a slave. What kind of work might HK7 have been required to do as a slave? When Owsley and Bruelheide examined her arm bones in the laboratory, they noticed muscle attachment sites that indicated she frequently flexed and extended her elbows. During the mid-18th century in Maryland, the majority of enslaved women worked in the fields, just like the men. Thus, HK7 probably hoed tobacco, inspected the leaves of the growing plants for pests such as hornworms and cutworms, and removed poor quality leaves near the base of the plant to allow the upper leaves to grow larger. If she hadn't worked in the fields, grinding corn may have been one of her chores. After corn was harvested, dried, and removed from the cob, it had to be ground into meal so that it could be used to make bread and mush. Unless there was a nearby mill where the planter could take the dried kernels to be ground by machine, this step had to be done by hand with a mortar and pestle. This tiring task topped the list of household drudgery. It required raising and dropping an iron pestle, which weighed as much as five pounds, many thousands of times to crush the corn into minuscule pieces. Preparing wool to make cloth also requires flexing and extending the elbows. During the 1600s, all cloth in the Chesapeake colonies was imported from Europe, but by the mid-1700s, some planters in the region had begun producing cloth. If the planter who owned the Knoll property had been among them, HK7's work might have included a process called carding. A clump of wool is placed on a paddle with rows of nearly spaced wire teeth on it. A second, similarly toothed paddle, is pressed into the wool and pulled through it. The teeth of the two paddles align the wool fibers so that they can be spun together into yarn on a spinning wheel. These actions must be repeated several times for each clump of wool. Any of these jobs, along with less complex ones, such as hauling buckets of water from a well and doing laundry, would have caused HK7 to develop strong arm muscles. While her bones clearly indicate that she used her arms for strenuous physical activity, it's impossible to conclude exactly which tasks she did only that there were numerous and that she'd done them since she was a little girl. To add to this slowly growing portrait of the lives of the Harley Knoll people, the team sent samples from the remains of carbon-13 analysis. HK9, the old man, had a carbon-13 value of negative 13.8. HK7's carbon value was negative 
Both values are consistent with those of a person who has eaten a corn-based diet for a long period of time. Remember, an English carbon-13 value is between negative 21 to negative 18. No one knows if either HK7 or HK9 was born in Maryland. The question of their birthplaces joins several other unknowns about the people of Harley Knoll. We can't be certain whether HK7 and HK9 were slaves, indentured servants, or free persons, or exactly what types of work they did. We may never learn how they died, whether they were related, or even if they knew each other. But we do know that they were well regarded by family or friends. Unlike the boy at Levy Neck, both were buried with care and respect when their lives of intense labor ended.